Good evening. I'm Farah Jasmine Griffin, Chair of the African American and African Diaspora Studies Department here at Columbia University. And I wanna thank you for joining us this evening for this wonderful reading by um, someone who is part of our IRAS ADS family. I am just been looking forward to this for some time. And I'm so happy to welcome Danielle Evans um, back to Columbia, in some ways back home to IRAS and welcome her to the new department as well. Uh, Danielle Evans is the author of the short story collections Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self and the most recently of The House of Historical Corrections. Her work has won honors and awards, including the Penn Robert W. Bingham, Bingham Prize, the Hurston Wright Award for Fiction, the Patterson Prize for Fiction, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. She is a finalist for the 2021 Story Prize. Her work has appeared in magazines, including the Paris Review, the Public Space, American Short Fiction, Callaloo, and the Swanee Review, and has been anthologized in the best American short stories and new stories from the South. She currently teaches writing in the writing seminars at John Hopkins University. And tonight she's going to be reading from her most recent collection, the Office of Historical Corrections. Hello, Danielle, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me back. Um, it's so nice to see you and hopefully someday again, I will be able to come menace the Institute in person, but <laughs> it's a delight to be back virtually. Yes, I was hoping when we were planning this, hoping against hope that we'd be together, but we'll get you back. Uh, the way this evening will go is that Danielle will read um, and then she and I will have a brief conversation and, and then open it up for conversation with you all. Please use the Q&A function uh, and we will take as many questions or comments as we can. Danielle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read slightly less than half of one of the short stories in the collection. I'm going to read to you from the short story Alcatraz. I'm going to start at the beginning, so I don't think I need to set anything up, and then I will leave time um, to talk to everyone. Alcatraz. Everyone had told me that Alcatraz was nothing but a tourist trap, but I was desperate that summer for anything that would give my mother a sense of closure. And it seemed fortuitous that the prison that had opened all the wounds in the first place was right in the middle of the water I could see from the window of my new apartment. I hadn't come to the bay on purpose. A string of coincidences and a life I hadn't known I'd wanted until I got there brought me to Oakland. Still, almost since the day I had arrived, it seemed like the only thing keeping me from the island was deliberate avoidance. I felt like I'd gotten it backward. Everyone else I'd met who'd come to California from the East Coast was running away from something. And I'd gone and gotten so close to the sting of the past that sometimes it seemed like I could touch it. I had come west to work at an experimental after school theater and dance therapy program for children who had been abused. A friend I'd gone to college with spent months recruiting me, sending me literature about the program, smiling children's faces, photographs of the Bay and the Pacific. I was sold on the adventure on the postcard perfect water specific shade of blue. But by the time I said yes, she decided to move to Texas to begin a PhD program. I went anyway. I was 24 and convinced that the life in which I made some critically important difference to everyone around me could start on my command, that the world was only waiting to know what I asked of it. I was anxious and exhausted all the time then, but I remember those days now as being filled with optimism, a sense of possibility. The organization's budget was so strained that our supervisors worked for free some months when we were, when we were between grants. I made ends meet tutoring and doing SAT prep for kids in Berkeley and Marin County. Two of our college student volunteers quit after working at the center for less than a week. One of them had her cell phone stolen and the other was cursed out by four different kids in three different languages. My own first week on the job, a child had threatened to stab me with a pencil, but by and large, I loved the work I did. The crayon drawings and earnest thank you letters I got to pin to my wall, the way kids who used to greet me with skittishness at best, open contempt and hostility at worst, started running to hug me when I walked through the door. My mother had never been to the West Coast and didn't like that I was there. We were East Coast people and this coast had done us wrong, almost kept us from existing. My great grandfather had done time here, had been kept in the basement of Alcatraz and been told every day that when he was dead, they would feed him to the rats. He was 18 then, finally of legal age to be in the army, except he'd been in it three years already thanks to a falsified birth certificate. 
It was 1920 and Alcatraz was still a military prison, infamous not for its gangsters, but among would-be deserters. They were still building the parts of the prison that would later be immortalized, but it was already enough of a prison to be Charles Sullivan's private hell, the one he never really left, the one my mother, God bless her, was still trying to redeem. My mother was born nearly four decades later, born at all because after two years, the army with the help of his appointed lawyer admitted their mistake. They cleared him of murder and told him he was free to go. He took the long way back to the Bronx, spent years trying to make himself homes in inhospitable places, when he finally arrived back in New York, he married Louise, the first woman who took pity on him, and they had two children, the younger of whom was my grandmother. I never met her. She left a few months after my mother, a brown girl in a white family, was born. When my mother was six, a neighbor told her to her face that her own mother was too ashamed to stay in the house and claim her. After she came home crying, Charlie Sullivan pricked his finger and then hers and pressed them together and said they had the same blood now and whatever she was, he was too. But my mother was too young to have heard of the one drop rule and the intention was lost on her until years later. My mother called her grandparents, Grammy and Papa. Grammy was firmly assigned the role of grandparent because they all chose to believe her mother might return someday, but Papa was her everything. When she was 13, her Grammy died and my mother belatedly came to appreciate what she had done while alive. Scrolled away money before Papa spent it, saw to it that the rent was paid and the heat was on and everyone in the house had clean clothes and three meals a day and that her husband stayed sober enough to work except when he had the prison nightmares and had to be kept drunk enough not to wake the neighbors with screams. At 18, my mother left home for college. She only went as far as Jersey, but her grandfather was dead within two years of her going. It wouldn't occur to me until well into my adulthood, most of it spent in California, a full country away from her, to question my mother's conviction that the former event had caused the latter, or to wonder what she wanted me to do with a cautionary tale in which the caution was against growing up. By the time she came to visit me in Oakland, my mother had been involved in some form of litigation or negotiation with the US government for the better part of 20 years. Her latest calculations, which she had me double check annually adding the accrued interest, concluded that the US government owed us $227,000, $227,035.87. She wanted the number exact so that we did not seem unreasonable. I was a kid when she started the complaint process, first with letters to the board for correction of military records, the same board her grandfather had been writing letters to for years before he died. That was right after my parents' divorce, though I'm not sure it's fair to imply the correlation. Before the divorce, they had fights about the fact that she wouldn't sell any of Papa's old belongings or dispose of the boxes of paperwork, but it wasn't those fights or any other that finally broke them up, so much as the way they had less and less to say to one another when they were happy. With my father out of the house, my mother threw herself into a mission to clear her grandfather's name, to finish in her lifetime what he hadn't been able to finish in his. There were no adults around to talk her out of it, only me. She asked me what I would do if someone told a lie about her, asked if she died with it still written down somewhere, whether I would ever give up fighting to prove the truth. I knew that the only correct answer was no. Her odds of succeeding were low. When she started the process, it had been 15 years since Papa's death and more than 70 since the conviction. Still, there was a logic to her argument. The discharge paper she kept car carbon copies of in her attic said he'd been pardoned, and she thought it would be easy from there to have his dishonorable discharge changed to an honorable one. It didn't make sense, she reasoned, that if he'd been cleared of the crime he was accused of, the government should consider him dishonorable. As years passed without action or response, she was buoyed by occasional signs of what she saw as precedent on her side. In 1999, Lieutenant Henry Flipper, the first black graduate of West Point, had been given a posthumous presidential pardon more than 100 years after he was falsely charged with embezzlement in a scandal designed to push him out of the service. My mother bought a bottle of champagne and shared it with me while we watched the official pardon ceremony where descendants of the late Lieutenant Flipper sat on a podium with Bill Clinton and Colin Powell and received a formal apology. Do you see what happens, my mother had asked me, when you don't give up on making things right? But what I had seen happen before that brief moment of optimism and especially in the five years since was my mother becoming increasingly dependent on an outcome that seemed less and less likely. She taught elementary school, but all of her holiday breaks, half days and weekends went into the litigation, into letters to the army, the president, her congressman. Not counting our hourly labor, my mother must have already spent almost half of the 220,000 we were theoretically owed on court filing fees, photocopies and certified letters. When I had lived at home, my spare time went into organizing the files, photocopying important documents, holding my breath. Two months after I moved to Oakland, the Supreme Court denied my mother's request that they hear her appeal against the VA. My mother called from the other side of the country, sounding defeated. There was nobody left to argue with. Papa will never have his name back, she said. You know who he was, I said, but it didn't seem to comfort her any. 
After I got off the phone with her, I'd felt helpless and finally booked a reservation in one of the Alcatraz tour boats. When I got out to the docks at my appointed time, I couldn't bring myself to actually get on the boat. I'd milled around Fisherman's Wharf instead, ducking out of tourist snapshots and trying to name the source of my unease. I'd watched the water for a while, the same fierce unwavering blue of it that I felt had called me here and ended up shop stopping at one of the gift shops on the pier and buying my mother a poster commemorating the Native American takeover, takeover of the island. Alcatraz Indians, it said on the front, under a cartoonish picture of something half man, half eagle. I thought it might be easier to remember that this could also be a place of freedom, I scrawled on the back. She never mentioned receiving it. Reticence was not my mother's nature, and when, in the weeks that followed, she had less and less to say about anything, I panicked. She was still a few weeks away from the start of the school year. I insisted she come out to visit me. I wanted to see for myself how bad things were with her. She arrived 20 pounds lighter than when I had seen her a few months ago. My mother, who lived in discount denim and told me once she found mascara unseemly, was wearing makeup and designer heels. If I hadn't known she didn't believe in mood altering drugs, I would have taken her for heavily medicated. She was dressed like an actress auditioning for the part of my mother in a movie. A different daughter might have been reassured, but I looked at my mother and saw a person directing all of her energy toward being outwardly composed because the inside was a lost cause. How are you doing? I asked her once we'd gotten back from the airport and settled her into my apartment. How do you think? She asked. I offered to sleep on the couch and give her the bedroom, but she refused, and most nights passed out on the couch by 10 after watching syndicated sitcoms and having two glasses of wine. When I'd imagined her having more time for normalcy when the case was over, I hadn't imagined this. Nothing I suggested excited or distracted her. When pressed, she made increasingly bizarre plans for the future. She was moving in with me, never mind that she had a house full of things on the other side of the country. She was moving to France, never mind that she didn't speak French. She was joining the Peace Corps, never mind that she was in her late 40s and had never so much as been camping because she didn't understand why anyone would voluntarily separate themselves from reliable indoor plumbing. It was probably my mother's focus on unlikely and unreasonable futures that gave me the idea I could still fix something for her. I found Nancy Morton, who was technically my mother's first cousin, and besides me, her last living relative. Nancy was Charlie Sullivan's granddaughter too, and my mother had not seen her since his funeral. The family's failure to bridge their divide in her generation was on her list of ways Papa's legacy was being dishonored. I had already made arrangements with Nancy and booked the boat tickets by the time I explained the plan to my mother. She was wary. She had tried to reach out to her cousins when the litigation first began, and her letter had come back marked return to sender from the address she had for Nancy's older brother. They're still your family, I insisted. They are not my family, my mother said. We're just related. I'd finally convinced her the whole trip was what her grandfather would have wanted for us because I had her own words on my side. Almost immediately, I had doubts about the brilliance of my plan, but it was too late. I'd invited a group of practical strangers to meet us on a boat, and now here we were instant family, just add water. It was uncharacteristically hot for the Bay Area in August. The air felt thick and stifling like the East Coast summers I'd left behind. Nancy Morton kept pulling an economy-sized bottle of sunscreen out of her giant straw handbag and slathering gobs of it onto her already reddening skin. Her husband, Ken, kept staring at his sneakers. He had barely spoken since we'd all done handshakes and introductions at the pier. Actually, he'd spoken exactly six words since then, those words being, Kelly, put your damn clothes on when the younger daughter had taken off her damp t-shirt and began walking around in her bikini top. Their older daughter, Sarah, was 23. We shared a birthday, though a year apart, and looked as embarrassed by her family as I was. This was only the third time that my mother and Nancy had seen each other. When they were small children, Nancy and her brother had been brought to their grandparents' house for monthly visits on the condition that my mother was out of the house. By six, my mother understood that she was Black and her family was not, and this was why the rule existed, but her understanding was impersonal and matter of fact. It was a rule like gravity, one from a higher authority. From the window of the neighbor's apartment where she'd been sent, my mother could see Nancy on the front steps of their grandparents' building. She was a small girl with a long blonde braid hanging down her back. It brushed against the dingy ground as Nancy did her best to flatten the series of bottle caps with the rock. My mother was generally obedient, but her curiosity and her nagging sense that other children weren't sent away when their families came by got the best of her. While the neighbor who was supposed to be keeping an eye on her watched her stories in the bedroom, my mother went downstairs and peeked through the glass of the front door to get a better look at Nancy, who finally looked up and pressed her face against the other side of the glass to look back. My mother opened the door. Why were you watching me? Nancy asked. We're cousins, said my mother, and your hair looks pretend. It's not, said Nancy, and I don't have cousins. Do too, I live here with our Grammy and Papa.
The names meant nothing to Nancy, who called them Grandma and Grandpa Sullivan. What my mother offered as evidence the locket around her neck, the one with her grandparents' picture sealed in it. It was convincing enough for Nancy, who shrieked and hugged her. Nancy offered her a flattened bottle cap, and my mother, when my mother said it looked like a coin, they got the idea to play store, make believe buying and selling flowers and dirt from the backyard and the clothing and jewelry they were wearing. They were absorbed enough not to notice that Nancy's parents had emerged from the apartment and were on their way out until after Nancy's mother opened the front door and saw them playing together. She screamed her daughter's name and grabbed Nancy by her pigtail, pulling her by her hair down the block to their car, Nancy's neck straining unnaturally backward the whole way. My mother, afraid Nancy's mother would come back for it, clutched the bottle cap in her hand so tightly that it sliced her skin. Nancy cried hysterically as her mother shoved her into the back seat and slammed the door without a word to or from her husband, who took his son's hand, followed his wife and screaming daughter to the car, and started the engine without so much as saying goodbye. My mother watched them drive away like that, her own palm still bleeding. Nancy's tear-streaked face was pressed against the rear window. It was the last time her uncle brought his family over, the last time my mother saw him, aside from his parents' funerals. For years, she told and retold Papa the story of the game as if she could find the detail that had made it go wrong until she was old enough to understand that she was the detail, the wrong thing. Someday, Papa told her, all this foolishness will be done and all my grandchildren and their children will celebrate together. But whatever it would take to make someday happen, it did not seem to be happening in her house. You have no idea how much you take for granted, my mother told me the first time I brought a white friend home to play. But she was wrong about that. You take nothing for granted when the price of it is etched across the face of the person you love the most, when you are born into a series of loans and know you will never be up to the cost of the debt. Cecilia is studying to be a doctor, my mother told the Mortons as we waited for the ferry to depart. It wasn't true. I had a master's in public health, which my mother liked to think of as a stepping stone to medical school rather than the beginning of a career in social work. When I told my father what I planned to do with my life, he told me not to blame him for the fact that I inherited my mother's enthusiasm for impractical causes, but he sent me the money for the plane ticket. A doctor, said Nancy. That's impressive. Perhaps some of your drive will rub off on Sarah. She has it in her head to go traipsing around the desert for a year. I looked at Sarah with real interest for the first time. She was rolling her eyes and twisting a strand of hair around her finger so tightly that her fingertips were turning red. We were built similarly, tits so that anything you wore that wasn't a giant burlap sack bordered on obscene, but the resemblance ended there. She'd made a pillow out of her Vanderbilt sweatshirt and was resting against it, dangling one arm over the back edge of her seat. Cecilia has always been good with science, my mother said. She gets that from her father's side. I'd wanted to look you up for years, but it was Cecilia and her tech smarts that found you. I never had much of a head for science. My mother was basing my scientific excellence on a ribbon I'd won for growing hydroponic tomatoes in the seventh grade, though I had subsequently nearly failed biochemistry and dropped physics altogether. My father was a food critic who had recently been berated by a molecular gastronomist for identifying liquid nitrogen as smoke in his review. My text marks consisted of having entered Nancy Morton's name, older brother's name into Google. In fairness to my mother, we had, both of us, grown up without the ability to type someone's name into the ether and receive an immediate report on their current whereabouts. I'd always known about her cousins, but only that year had it occurred to me that one of the great unanswerable questions of her life was now, in fact, answerable, and instantly at that. The internet did still feel like a kind of mysterious magic then, a new power we had all only recently been granted and were still learning to use. When I finally left the Bay 15 years later, the nonprofit I'd worked, at was, I'd worked for was shutting down and I was already barely able to keep up with the rent increases. I took a long walk through the hills and looked across the water at the city that Tech rebuilt and tried to remember when I'd first seen it coming, when I'd remembered that all magic, all progress has a price. Even at the time, the magic I used to get us answers had a trace of the ominous. It turned out that Nancy's brother had been killed in a car crash three years earlier. Nancy and her family had been mentioned in the obituary. I'd offered my belated condolences and invited them down to meet one of us, to meet us on one of the Alcatraz ferries. They lived farther north in Sonoma, and after a brief hesitation, she had agreed to drive down for the day. Well, it was different then, Nancy said, with girls in science. They didn't encourage us much, did they, Anne? No, said my mother. No, they didn't. Lots of things were different then. An unsaid thing hung in the air for a moment. Ken Morton cleared his throat. So he asked, why Alcatraz? Lovely day for it, but kind of an odd choice. I was going to ask the same thing. Interesting place for a reunion. We've never been, just moved out to a few years ago, and never got around to half the tours. I hear it's beautiful, though. My mother looked like she might cry. Without thinking, I moved closer to her. It hadn't occurred to me to tell them why I had invited them here specifically. I had assumed that they would know. 
didn't you know my mother asked that Papa was at Alcatraz, but that's why he, that's why things happened the way they did. A moment of surprise passed over Nancy's face and then she collected herself. I had heard, she said slowly, that he had done some time in prison was never really, never really right after that. I didn't know that it was Alcatraz. You know, I didn't get to know him that well. Not like you did. I guess you didn't, said my mother. Nobody else did. My mother sat on one of the benches on deck and hugged her arms to her chest. I sat down beside her. I could tell she was trying not to cry. I put an arm around her and patted her shoulder gently. The Mortons looked embarrassed to be there and then turned away to watch San Francisco disappear from view. Here's what you have to understand about my mother's childhood. It wasn't one. Her mother was the youngest of Charlie and Louise's two children, both raised on the seesaw of his impractical excesses and her Yankee frugality. At 16, my grandmother went off to join a theater. Two years later, she came back with a black baby. She stayed home long enough to leave my mother in her parents' care and to meet a traveling salesman whom she ran off with a few months later. They never heard from her again. Some years later, the salesman sent a note with a copy of her obituary attached. When my mother was small, she and Papa would sit and make up stories about all the places her mother might be. Infinity Land, somewhere north of Kansas, a place where you kept going and going but could never leave because it was always getting bigger. Elf World, somewhere in West Florida, where they kept shrinking you and shrinking you, and you didn't realize you were an elf too until it was too late to do anything about it. For years, they lived together in the imaginary places, a world you could only be kept from by enchantment, but as soon as she was old enough, my mother left and kept going too, left that house, and let the business of loving the man who raised her be confined to telephone calls from faraway places. It was a decision that probably saved her life, and one for which she never forgave herself. I didn't, and still don't, dare compare the terms of my life to my mother's, the stakes of my choices to hers, but I understand more now about how it feels to love the excess in people, about how knowing someone else's love will consume you doesn't make it any less real or any less reciprocated, about how you can leave a person behind just to save the thing they value most, yourself. Or maybe I understood it even then, but couldn't have told you how. Okay, um, and I will stop there and take some questions. Wow. It's, um... It's an extraordinary story. Um, so we have some questions. Uh, I Well, we have one, but uh, I'll start off with um, just a few that came to me as I was reading the, the broader collection. One, <clears throat> and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, um, but I'll try to ask it differently. Um, you, you write in the short story form, and I have to say I'm very grateful. That's one of my, my favorite forms. Um, and I wondered, if it was a form that you found, or did it find you? That's a, that is a new way of answering the question. I was ready to give my answer, and then it, it's a new question. Um, I think um, I think it found me. Um, I think while I was I um, when I was a, I was an African American studies major um, in college, but I also took creative writing classes. And I think I, I hadn't really thought much about the short story as a form um, before that, but I kind of fell in love with it. And I think I fell in love with it partly because there's a density to the form. I mean, I think even in that story, there's so much sort of slipperiness about time. And I think the short story, I mean, a lot of fiction does this, but I think the short story kind of forces you to work with compression and the movement of time. So that's what's happening is always a kind of forward motion, but also a kind of movement within the paragraph between the past, present, and future. And so I like I like that space. I like that because it feels to me um, like it gives you an extra layer of sometimes characterization, sometimes um, kind of authorial directive, but to think about both the kind of vertical movement of the story along with the forward motion of the story. Um, and I also think I, I think I liked the short story form as a younger writer because I was so, and I think I, I care less about it now because like now I'm a little bit older and I care less what people think about me. But I think I was so anxious as a younger writer that especially as a black woman writer that everything I wrote would be taken strictly as autobiography. And I thought, well, how can I confound that? Like, how can I, um, how can I sort of create a narrative that is harder to pin me to? <laughs> and the short story felt like one of those things where I could have a collection that was centered on young black women, but that had enough different voices or different experiences that it couldn't, you'd have to sort of reckon with the craft of it instead of just treating me like I was publishing my diary. And I think that that was, um, that was like more important to me, I think 
as a younger writer than it is now, I think I, I'm less concerned about perception, but I also think that I, I enjoy that kind of shape-shifting still. I enjoy that kind of conversational space of a short story that lets you sometimes ask the same question over and over again, but answer it differently. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that you, you know, for me as a reader, one of the things that I enjoy reading your collections um, and that I enjoy about the short story is I fall in love with a writer and I want as much of you as I can get. And um, here I, I get that sensibility, that voice in all these different ways in these different geographies and different characters, which you just, you do beautifully. So I hope that for people who have not read, read um, the story that you share with us tonight, that that will whet their appetites to go further. Um, loss, a sense of loss seems pervasive in this collection. I mean, you know, they, they each story stands on its own. Um, yet there are certain things that um, one feels in reading them all. And perhaps one of the more dominant things that I felt was a sense of loss. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about that, about the sense of loss that you give language to in these stories? Yeah, um, and I think this is one of the things where now it's sort of very obvious to me that this book is a lot about grief and loss that, you know, I was working on it um, while and immediately after my mother died. And so like in retrospect, of course it's about grief, but I didn't, it, it wasn't, you know, for years I had, it because I work in academia and you have to turn in these sort of annual reports on what you're doing. And I don't think that word made it into any of them until like I was actually writing the description of the finished book, I think. It took me a long time to see it, which I think is fine. I think sometimes as a writer, you know, your subconscious is smarter than you are and it's designed that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, had I known um, some of the places the stories were going, I might've tried to avoid them. So um, it was probably a, for my own protection that my brain didn't tell me that I was writing about grief until I'd already done it. And, um, and sometimes it would sort of sneak up on me that I would be looking for the place where the story kind of breaks open. I think that because of that sort of vertical motion in a story, often a lot of the stories happening beneath the page. And I think that's more true of these stories um, than in my first book because the structure is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I think my first book was mostly coming of age stories. And so often there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an event happening or being anticipated, right? And so a lot of the emotion in the story is surrounding that event and hopefully in a more complicated way than you anticipate. But I think a lot of the stories in this collection um, are about kind of, how you make a life in the space of not feeling like you have choices over the major things that are happening. So the major thing is kind of beneath the story until it comes to the surface. And so often it would surprise me when it came to the surface. And then of course I'd go back and edit and revise so that I, once I realized what the story was about to make it make sense. But, um, but how often that thing was grief or some kind of um, inherited trauma or history um, was something that often I didn't know until the second draft of the story. And then when I sort of put the stories in conversation made a lot more sense. And so there were places in revision where I had to go back into the places of the story that kind of hurt the most um, to, to kind of open that up once I saw that it was there. You know, I wondered that, I mean, I, I, you, you just answered my next question because oh, no. one of the things I wondered, especially, um, you know, for, for, for the people in the audience, this is a collection of stories and then there's a novella um, and the title, the, 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 the title of the collection takes its name title from the novella. And it was especially in reading that um, that I wondered, I, I was like, did she know she was going here? Cause I didn't <laughs> see it coming. Like, and I, you know, I usually am looking for clues and I so didn't see it coming. And so I thought, did she know, did she set out to go here or did, was she as surprised as you know, we are reading it? <laughs> yeah, no, I did not. And I, I did, that was, usually I, I know the point of view of the story and that rarely changes, but that story was originally in third person and I got to the end and then I saw what happened and I felt like I needed to rewrite it in first person. So, um, and then I had to cut um, partly because of the voice change and partly because once I saw where it was going, there was a lot more like humor in it in the first pass. And I was like, oh no, this, this person is telling this first person story in the wake of trauma and there can be some deflexive humor, but, but there can't be as many kind of jokes or kind of wandering riffs as there were in the first version because it doesn't make sense anymore. So that was one of the things I had to sort of pair back in revision. Yeah. Well, there, but the, you know, there's humor in all your work. I mean, I find myself laughing aloud, even though it's also very painful. And one of the things I think that you do so well, I, I can't wait to teach some of these stories because you bring like kind of large issues of race and history 
down to very, um, you know, intimate relations, relationships in families. Um, and I think especially in that story, Alcatraz, that you shared with us, um, you know, the family could very well be our nation in some ways. Um, and you just handle that beautifully. And also I was gonna ask you about um, your choice of narration because you often do use the first person. Um, so much so that, not, not so much so, but even when you're not using it, I found myself having to go back and look at stories again to say, was that in the first person? Because I feel so deeply connected to this protagonist um, that, that it felt like the first person oftentimes. Yeah, I mean, I like I like first person because I think it's a way of adding another layer to the story because there's some there's some agency or intention in the telling and the framing of the story, and so it makes the framing of the story a kind of psychological choice as much as a narrative choice. And I think less of this book is in first person than my first book because I felt like in some cases because of that same kind of structural disconnect that we talked about before, I felt like some of these characters didn't yet know what kind of story they were in. And so I could come at it more directly through close third. Um, so even though you're still getting some sense of their voice and, and their perception of the world, um, I didn't believe some of these characters had the level of self-awareness it would take to tell you their story or even kind of tell you where the story stopped and started, that they were as surprised as anyone else right. when the story they were in turned out to be what it was. Yeah. And so, um, so I was playing with structure and voice a little bit um, more in this collection than in my first collection. But I, I do think that, you know, there's this old workshop cliche, show, don't tell. And I get what it means. I, I know what we're trying to say there. But I do think that the exciting thing for me about writing is that we're storytellers, right? That somebody, whether it's a narrator or a character, is like seeing the world in a particular way and wants you to see something and you can choose to see what they see or see around it. Um, but I think that aspect of telling is really fascinating to me because that's where both my investment and my pushback as a reader tend to come in. Yeah, yeah, no. And even, you know, um, the first person, you begin to be a little distrustful of them sometimes or of their own awareness of, um, you, you know, I think you see them beginning to become aware of the role that they've played or their own psychology in the process of the story. I'll go to the Q&A. We have one question here, um, but it's a, it's a good one. And it's um, from, unless there are two Nell Painters in the world, <laughs> this is Nell Painter, um, historian and visual artist who ask, well, first she says, Thank you for so eloquent an elaboration of the truths and emotions of history. And then she asked, do you believe in nonfiction history? Oh my goodness. I'm just, first of all, I'm just like so excited that I'm talking to like <laughs> Professor Griffin and Nell Painter. Like this is just um, like delightful. But, um, but this is also like a hard question. So let me think about this question for a second. Yeah. Um, do I believe, I mean, as a, as a genre, yes, but I also, I mean, I think that there are places in this collection where there are more detailed answers I could have gotten in like an archival process, that I could have sort of been more of a historian and less of a fiction writer. And I think I was interested in the gaps in the record because that also is a story and that also is a story of history, right? Like what didn't get recorded, um, what didn't get, um, what we don't trust the records of for whatever reason. And so I think that one answer to that is I believe in kind of a pluralistic history where there are probably 10 versions of a story and we only know one. It also seems possible that in some cases, all 10 versions might be false, right? That there are, um, there are political reasons like histories are kept for us, but there are also personal and familial reasons why histories are sort of erased or papered over or silenced. And so um, sometimes it's a question of just like what exists, what, what we don't know because no one bothered to record it and, and what we don't know because someone had an agenda when they told it. And so I don't know if I believe in a sort of fundamental truth, but I believe in a fundamental absence that can be filled by telling more versions of the story. I think that one of the most interesting things I, I did when I was working on this book was go through like 20 years of microfiche for the Milwaukee NAACP, partly because there were there's been not a lot of writing about the black community in Wisconsin, although it was a, a sizable, you know, there's a sizable history there, but it just isn't, so like there's, there are a couple of black papers, but they went through months, sometimes years where they didn't print um, because 
for budgetary reasons. And then there are not every issue is preserved. So like the archives are incomplete there. Um, the, there's this sort of counter narrative where you can tell the guy who runs the Milwaukee chapter like hates the NWC official who comes like to check on them once a year. And so there's this clear tension and like, but you only have like half the story. And so, I, you know, it's sort of hard to even decide like whose side of this argument you're on. Um, and it's like, who would you even ask about that at this point? <laughs> like, um, and so there are all kinds of things that are sort of partially preserved. And I guess I'm, I think there are writers who beautifully do historical work, both in fiction and nonfiction, where they're looking for those answers. And I think I am as interested in those silences as anything else. I mean, I think another kind of version of that first person or close third question is that I'm interested always in the space between the interior self and the exterior self, right? The space between our performed selves and yeah. like how we're thinking or feeling or what we say and what we mean. And I think history is another version of that gap for me, right? Like the difference between um, our actual um, our actual country and um, the, ver the sort of myth mythologized version of the country, the difference between the stories we tell ourselves about history, um, both public and private, and the actual lived experience of that. And yeah. so sometimes I just want to leave the silence. Well, there's a line that I saw in one of the stories, I think it might've been, um, it might have been Alcatraz, but I felt like it resonated across more than one story. And you say, you talk about um, the, the person who is outwardly composed because the inside was lost, right? And they're, they're often these kind of, you know, kind of attention to outward appearance and what message you wanna give, send across or how you wanna be treated or greeted. And then there's something else entirely going on on the inside. So um, Professor Painter follows up and then we have two more good questions. She says, you do believe in nonfiction history as historians think about it, understanding the contingencies of what gets kept and what gets neglected and who's reading the archive. You know, so that's great. Um, all right, uh, you talked about preferring the short story form because of its density. I was wondering, how do you utilize that density to convey so much emotion within a story? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the people, the writers that I initially learned from in terms of thinking about this are most concretely probably Edward P. Jones and Alice Munro, who I think are both just geniuses with time that you sort of see, and you don't even know sometimes with, I mean, sometimes with Alice Munro, it's a little bit, I don't, I don't mean obvious as an insult, but it's a little bit obvious because there's like a frame story, there's a story happening in the present and there's an occasion to look back on the story you can sort of see how she's doing it sometimes sometimes i don't know how she's doing it either i don't know sometimes i'm like i don't even know how we just moved 20 years in that paragraph but we did and it was perfect <laughs> and but i think that those are the writers sort of i looked at um in terms of thinking about how the story can move can make use of that kind of time space or vertical space um those you know i think all the time about that i, I teach also a lot that edward p jones story the first day where like so much, I mean, there's a beautiful story all around, but so much of the weight of that story is in the very first sentence, like long before I became ashamed of my mother on an ordinary September morning. I think I reversed the clauses. Like it's on an ordinary September morning long before I became learned to be ashamed of my mother. And we don't like ever come all the way back to that. It's just implicit at everything that's happening, which is a story about the first day of school, but it just carries so much weight and creates, puts all of the tension to that story. And so I think sometimes like it's, it doesn't have to be a lot, right? Like I don't have to go all the way into the future and say, oh, this is how this event reverberated and this is how the legacy of this affected this person. I just have to give you enough. And I think thinking about um, what is enough to suggest the way in which this moment is gonna carry forward or what is enough to suggest something about the past this person is carrying with them. Um, and how can I think about, again, the sort of the psychological movement of the story so those juxtapositions make emotional sense even if they don't seem like inherently mm -hmm. logical. Like, why is this person associating this memory with this moment? Um, what is interesting about the trigger? I also think that space is a really interesting way to think about density, that mm -hmm. space is a really interesting way to think about time because physical places also have a way of like marking the present and, and establishing us and grounding us in the world, but suggesting something about the past and something about the future, yeah. that, that a physical place has a kind of map or visual archive of the other things it's been and often a sort of suggestion of what it's becoming or what's happening around it or what's changing. And so sometimes like figuring out a way to tether that emotional space to the physical world is really helpful. You do that certainly with, you know, 
spaces that are dense in meaning and um, you know, not just the geographical location, but also, you know, the plaque in Wisconsin or 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 the Titanic <laughs> or any of these other, you know, very specific places that carry with them so much meaning. So Marcus Taylor says, when your dialogue comes up, your characters come alive. Are you strategic when it comes to using dialogue? Yeah, um, the most useful thing I ever heard anyone say about dialogue, and I think it was Elizabeth McCracken in like my first semester of graduate school, said not to think about dialogue as what your characters say to each other, but as what they do to each other. Because dialogue is like the only place in fiction where we're actually in real world time most of the time, right? That like we can get real slow in a scene, but the only time it takes you as long in the real world as it does to do something in a story is to say something. So there's inherently a lot of weight on dialogue, even if it seems um, unimportant. And so I want dialogue to be doing scene work. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be like super thematic. In fact, I mean, the other thing about dialogue is that it's often the other, the second most useful thing I heard about dialogue was actually probably at Columbia from Victor Laval, who like asked us to pay attention to the way people talk because the way that people, the way that people talk is often kind of much more fragmented and less coherent in real life than it appears in fiction. And so, um, we don't actually want to transcribe written speech because no one wants to read that. <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense and you can't usually follow a conversation entirely based on eavesdropping. So there has to be sort of some, um, some narrative purpose for the dialogue, even if it doesn't seem super heavy handed. And so that's the trick, right? Is how does this dialogue do thematic or character work, but also feel natural and that it feels like the kind of thing we could overhear um, because it doesn't sound super pointed. It doesn't sound fake, but it is fake. Yeah. Um, I don't know that's helpful in terms of figuring out how to do it, but that, that's the sort of the poles that I'm trying to, to navigate is this is a place where I'm asking for your like full time and attention. So why am I doing that? What kind of work is it doing in the story? Um, how is this something that somebody is actually reacting to or something that feels active? Um, but also how can I disguise that and hide it and make it feel like you just heard this on the bus, even though it's more formal and more polished than what you'd hear on the bus probably. A real part of your craft, you know. Um, so Noah Evans says, love the story. Thanks for sharing. I was particularly struck by the density and sprawling scope of its coverage, which felt akin to Gabriel Garcia Marcus's 100 Years of Solitude. When covering a story that spans so many lives, so much time, how do you decide what to include and what is the process by which the work coalesces into its final form? That's a really good question. And I think I think the answer is different for every story. So I'll try to answer it for specifically this one, because I do think that for me, a first draft is always kind of figuring out what is the about of the story? What are the core, what is the kind of immediate question of the story? So sometimes it's a plot question, sometimes it's a narrative question, but what is the thing that I've sort of promised to resolve in some way by the end of the story? And then what is the underneath thing or the thematic question or the kind of larger space of the story? And a lot of my revision is, um, thinking about the balance between those questions, thinking about how they're operating the story and when they're introduced. And so that can look a lot of different ways depending on what the story is and also kind of what kind of shape it's in when I first see it. Um, I think with this story, it had actually a much longer and more nebulous process than most of my work. And that I did wrote the, I wrote the first draft fairly quickly and I wrote the first draft before actually my first book was published. I wrote the first draft of the story in graduate school um, and I, um, which is the only story I've ever asked for anyone's permission on because usually I sort of feel like, you know, your life belongs to you, but it's not a true story by any stretch, but there was enough family history in it that I wanted my mother to read it. And I said, if you don't want me to publish this, I won't ever send it anywhere. And, and she read it and she liked it, um, but it took me in and actually was really excited about it being published. So that, um, that felt good, but it took me, at that point I hadn't published anything. I don't even know why it was like, in retrospect, it was like, this is so pretentious to me to be like, mommy, I won't publish this story if you don't like it. Like who was publishing my work? I was like 26, no one cared. But, um, so um, younger than that even. So I, um, anyway, I had on to it for years. I worked on it to make it a better and closer to publishable story. <laughs> um, and eventually someone did publish it. In fact, Kalalu published it um, right after my first book came out. And, um, and then I was looking at it and it seemed to make so much sense thematically with the work in this collection because it is so much about history and, and narratives and inheritance. I felt like it belonged in this collection, 
but it also had been, you know, 10 years since the published version of it had come out. And I felt like in some ways a different writer, but I also felt like the story in, in some ways still felt like the story that more than anything else belonged to people other than me. And my mother was dead and I couldn't ask her again, you know? And so that layering, in trying to figure out how I could sort of build the frame story out around the core of the story was part of that navigation because there was always a retrospective voice. And I felt like in order to, for it to feel more like the writer I am now, I needed to put more pressure on that retrospective voice. Um, I needed to have room for some of for some of me as a writer to come in, but that a lot of the sort of center of the story had to be preserved. And so, um, and there was always, I mean, there was always a lot of movement in time in the story because it was a story that was so much about, you know, the way in which the present is always haunted by the past and the ways in which it is and isn't possible to reclaim or redeem the past. And so I kind of worked with that movement to spend a little bit longer in both the present of the story and the present of the voice um, to give myself a little bit of room while keeping the core of the story at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. So it was a slightly stranger process, I think, because often I'm not precious about revision. Often I'm just, you know, we'll sort of rip the floorboards out and start the story over. And I didn't feel like I could do that with this one. Yeah. Well, you do with that story and, and some of the others, but especially that one, I mean, you do such interesting things with generations, you know, um, and that's also part of the time in the history, right? So, you know, there's the grandfather who went through this experience, this traumatic experience, and it's not his daughter who we know, it's the granddaughter. And then we have to get the daughter's story from the granddaughter. And yet the person telling the story is <laughs> the granddaughter's daughter. I mean, it's just, it, it's um, just beautifully constructed in that way. Joan Gaylord says, this collection includes many stories about family. Was that another discovery, like your comment about loss, or was it intentional? Do you intend it as a metaphor? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm always writing about family and I don't, um, I don't know that I intend it as a metaphor, but that doesn't mean that it, it isn't a metaphor. <laughs> Sometimes you're not the best judge of what your own work is actually doing. Um, but I think that I'm, I'm interested in family because I think it's, um, it creates a lifetime space for rhyming action, which is useful in a story because you're gonna see the same people and often repeat the same patterns and dynamics over and over again. And so family creates an inherent space for the possibility of an event or action, not even necessarily a large event, but something that sort of creates a before and after. It says like, oh, I'm not the same person I was then, or some kind of cycle is being perpetuated or broken because we can either see the pattern repeating or we can see what happens when somebody says, wait a minute. <laughs> and, and there's something interesting about that. And I also think that it's, it's where we learn our sense of storytelling, right? It's where we, in all kinds of ways, learn our capacity for performance, both in, in intimate spaces and also, I mean, I think especially if you're in a Black family, you're, the politics of performance are in one way or another taught to you in your home often, right? Like what, whether you're a person who's performing with respectability or who's taught not to do that and, you know, whether you're a person who's taught to be kind of cooperative or disruptive, like often that kind of politicized knowledge is also familial knowledge. It's familial training. It's, um, it's something you learn in home. So I think that family space is interesting for both kind of with the way that I think about character on a kind of intimate personal level and also the way to think about character in a larger kind of more external worldly sense. Mm -hmm. oh, when I read your short stories, I'm always both satisfied and frustrated when it ends. I know that feeling, just, <laughs> I don't want it to end, right? I always want to read more, I agree. How do you know when a character's story is over? Are you ever tempted to revisit a character? Yeah, I, mean, I get this question a lot and I feel like maybe I must be like a colder person than all of my readers because I'm like, I'm done with all of these people. I never want to see them again. And everyone else is like, I miss them. Aren't you worried about them? I'm like, no, they got enough time, done. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I do, I do think that um, a short story should, should ideally end with some space in which for you to both imagine and um, have some often anxiety, not necessarily anxiety, but some sense of the future. I think that um, if I've done my work, then 
it should end in a place where you can imagine what this is going to mean in five years or where this character is going to be in five years. And it might be more than one answer to that question. Yeah. Um, but I think that for me, and I know there are writers who do revisit characters, so I don't mean to sort of say that's not like a doable thing. I think that I feel unlikely to do it, never say never. But I think that I want that sort of slightly open space. I want that space that says like, this is what will keep the reader up at night imagining or wondering. Um, and this is the sort of set of possibilities I've created for this character in the future. And so um, I do think of the short story as a space that um, is conversational and where I'm only having maybe 60% of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so some of that space for the reader to come into the story is in the ending and in the imagining. And um, I try not to be too heavy handed. In fact, often if I'm deleting and revision, it's often toward the ending where sometimes I do feel like I've I've put in some kind of summary paragraph that is too much that I'm not leaving enough breathing room for the reader to sort of intuit the meeting or decide for themselves. Right. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think you're supposed to feel anxious and frustrated when you finish, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, I know that you know, <laughs> not so much frustrated, but I think that you, you know, you are not heavy handed at the ending, you know, you're, you're, you're simply not at all. I mean, you know, um, I saw in an interview with you, because I read all these interviews too, so, um, where you said, and I, I wanted you to elaborate upon this, you said, we should be talking about race more as a function of craft, of everybody's craft. Um, and I just wanted to know, could you elaborate on that? You know, what, what do you mean? Um, yeah, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm remembering that correctly, that the context of that was somebody asking like, whether it was okay to ask Black writers about race and craft. And so I think partly what I'm, what I'm saying is that it shouldn't only be Black writers being asked about race and craft because I'm certainly happy to talk about it. Like I think it is, it is, it is in my work in various ways, I think down to that sort of structural sense of the world. Um, you know, that, that question of inferiority and performance that we talked about earlier is so much for me also about race and gender. It's about how I've learned to anticipate how people are gonna to respond to me and try to sort of um, either play to that or get ahead of it or confound that in some way, right? Um, and I think that thinking about character in those terms is really important for me to understand who they are as people. I also think that, you know, just the, the geography of the world is so much about race and who has to think about where they're safe or unsafe or where they're comfortable or uncomfortable. You know, I, I sometimes do an exercise where I, I tell my students without giving them kind of any caveats, just give me directions from this place to this place. And you think about like, who assumes you have a car? Who assumes you're gonna take the bus? Who assumes you're gonna call an Uber? Who assumes that it's safe to walk? You know, who sends you down side streets because it's a shortcut? And who tells you to go down brightly the path? Who, who tells you to go through this neighborhood? And who's like, oh, that, that neighborhood's bad. You know, like all of those things are, um, politicized, but they're also all just about geography, right? And so I think that um, asking those kinds of questions about what assumptions are being made about space would benefit everybody. <laughs> um, asking those kinds of questions about how aware you are of who has the power to make who perform in the world would benefit everybody. And I think those are, those are for me always craft questions. And I think that often that question of, can you write outside your own experience? For me, it's not a like, should you question? It's a, like, I don't know, can you question? Because so many people, if they're used to occupying a position of power or they're used to being in a space where they're in the majority are not used to paying attention to how often they're being performed for or how often they're explicitly or implicitly demanding a kind of performance. And so I think in order to write a character who feels complex or layered or just accurate, you have to be aware of when somebody is kind of aware of you and when somebody's putting on a show. And um, and so sometimes some of those failures are not like, oh, you failed politically because you shouldn't have written this person that wasn't you. It's like you failed just as a, as a writer because you didn't give this person an interior life that made sense because you couldn't imagine it because you thought the surface level was the whole story. And so I think that as a craft question, that's a, that's a space in which we could be having sometimes more productive conversations than some of the people saying like, you told me I couldn't write this. I didn't tell you you couldn't, you just didn't. Like, <laughs> right, right. No, I mean, that's, we could do a whole seminar on that, you know? And I think that one of the things that, again, that I, I, I was pleasantly surprised to see is, you know, with some of your white characters, um, when you 
sort of explain um, what they felt at a particularly racially charged moment or what they didn't feel or, or what they don't have to worry about or what they're concerned about for the person of color. I mean, it's just really, um, you know, you, you give us such complex, rich, psychologically rich characters. All right. Um, Nathaniel says, thanks. Do you think you will dramatize your fiction for stage? I ask because you're so good at dialogue. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think I personally will not do that because it's just a skill set I don't have, but I'm delighted for someone else to do it. <laughs> so um, I think a couple of things are optioned in various ways that somebody might be doing something with them. And I'm, you know, I just think it's not my art form. And so I'm delighted for somebody whose art form it is to do something with it. Yeah. Um, so th there, there are several, um, I know there are several majors in the audience. So I'm going to ask you the question that they're all probably curious about. Um, you majored in African-American studies. You took um, courses in creative writing. Uh, did you find yourself utilizing your major um, at all in your, in your fiction writing? Um, certainly. I mean, I think, I mean, I think my, well, my focus within, I don't know if it still works this way, but at the time you had to have an area of specialty yeah. within the major. And so mine was on Black women's writing. And so certainly I think a lot of what I took with me was just having models for things and having work to be in conversation with. Um, and having, I mean, I think that there's a danger in being a writer because people don't pay attention to history and they don't pay attention, especially to Black women's history. And so people will mean it as a compliment, but tell you all the time that you're like the first person to do something. And I think it's useful for your own writing and ego to know that you're not, right? You're almost never the first person to have actually done something. Um, and I think to be able to sort of say like, no, this is actually like a long tradition that I'm working with and a long conversation I'm participating in. Um, it's both like, it gives you some support and I think takes some pressure off of your own work and you know makes you feel like you don't have to fill some void or you know, answer all the questions because other people have already done that work and some of your work can be to like pull them into the conversation. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I think certainly it was very useful to be, you know, and I do think that, you know, in the creative writing program at, program at Columbia, I was lucky in that we were reading a lot of, a lot of black writers, a lot of writers of color that it was also an education in kind of um, a world of contemporary writing that I hadn't been exposed to before college, but I think having both parts of that conversation, having that, oh, here's what people are doing right now, and also that sort of larger sense of history and conversational space of this is what people have been doing, and these are sort of other ways of thinking about the question was really useful to me. And also, I mean, I think, again, just thinking about the world um, as, as an effort. I mean, I think that increasingly, I think, and this has only become more true as time passes, that I feel like to understand anything about this country, you have to understand race and race as a structural condition. And I think that it is a major that helped me sort of um, better articulate that and better kind of point to examples of that in a way that shapes both my understanding of fiction and how I think about writing the structural world in fiction, but also, you know, how I pay attention to um, the present, you know, how I, how I know where to look. <laughs> Right, right. No, no, it's, 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 it's actually quite fascinating. I want to move on to ask you about something else. Um, so you wrote, I guess you wrote an essay that was then part of This American Life where you read the essay about um, the pandemic, basically, um, which was just, you know, it's a work of nonfiction, but it's so exquisitely pulled together and pulls together, I think, the um, sort of personal aloneness that so many of us felt, um, but also with the, um, the sort of political circumstances, you know, around black and brown death, and then the denial of um, the systemic causes of that. And then the surprise at the, um, the capaciousness of the movement for Black Lives that emerged. It's just, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna try to find it and put it in the chat so people can hear it. It, it was really quite moving. Um, so I wonder if you, you know, that piece came out of this experience. Were you, were you also writing um, and 
to what extent do you think having gone through the pandemic, um, is that something that will be a source of your, your writing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's, it was strange working on that because at first like an editor had asked me for something and I was like, I don't have anything to say about this. This is like, no. And then I thought about it and I was like, maybe I could get you something. And then of course it was supposed to be like two pages and I sent him this 10 page essay <laughs> and he's like, thanks, Danielle, thanks. I thought it was great about it. But, um, and then when it got picked up for This American Life, that was, I think I wrote the original essay in, in April of last year and then it got adopted in like June or July. And already that felt like it had been so long in pandemic time. So I had to think about kind of between the first version and the, the recorded version and what had changed. And some of it was like changing for adapt, adapting for the form for radio, but some of it was, I don't know, do I still feel this way? Do we have more information? Do we still have this question? And so it was interesting to think about kind of what we still knew and didn't and what I still felt and what already felt like a like a foreign emotion. and. Um, and yeah, I think I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't felt um, at my creative past, I think, because as a person who lives alone, I, I do feel like most of my desire to write is in some way conversational as much as we sort of talk about writers wanting to be alone and in their own heads. Like I only want to be alone because like I've been around other people so much that I'm exasperated. So when I'm not ever around other people, I don't ever get to that place where I want to be in my own head. Like there's nothing in my own head that I, that I have to, feel through right now. Um, and it is strange, I mean, I also like went on a whole book tour like from this couch. And so <laughs> it's been, it's, it's, it's been delightful to be able to like see different people and have different audiences, but it also somehow feels more draining to do it on Zoom than I think it would be. Cause you think, oh, you're losing the travel days. So it's easier, but some of those travel days create a buffer. Whereas like with everything online, it's just like you're on all the time and you don't have that downtime or, you know, where afterwards somebody, no matter, how eloquent you were or weren't somebody takes you at the dinner and tells you you sounded great. So like, I, um, I miss that. And, and I miss that sort of sense of community um, around being an artist because it is often isolated. And I think publishing a book is often the sort of like social period that follows that isolation. And so it's strange to have that feel also weirdly isolating. Um, so yeah, there are several like award ceremonies that I get to go to, but I get to go to you on Zoom. And I hope they know that I will be crashing those parties like in a ball gown as soon as like they're back in person. Like, I don't care that I'm not up for an award next year. I'm just gonna show up <laughs> like, hello. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, so um, it's also, it was all strange time. My current project, which I, I think the one lesson I've learned, I, I don't vow to have learned anything else, but the one lesson I've learned is to talk a little bit less about my work in progress before I'm sure what it is. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to be a little bit close to the vest with this um, with this new project, but it is partly, there's an incident of medical racism that turns into an incident of police violence. And there's an incident of, um, there's an, there's a way in which two people end up like living in this house who weren't supposed to live in this house. And so, I had a lot of questions because it was supposed to be set in the summer of 2019. And I was like, well, I can't move it to the summer of 2020 and put it in conversation with these other protests because then everyone has to be in their house because of coronavirus. And I really don't at this point want to read anything about coronavirus yeah. or feel ready to write about it. Right. But if I right. leave it in 2019, it feels strange that it's sort of, not to say that like there isn't always protest, like there isn't, there's been no summer in American history where there hasn't been some kind of incident in protest, but it feels, odd to like not be able to comment directly on a movement that it's then going to be read in conversation with. Yeah. And so I was writing around that and trying to figure out how to solve that time trap. And I don't know that I've arrived at it yet. Um, but Interesting. <laughs> so you also, you do mention in that, um, in that piece that you were ordering a lot of books and reading a lot of books. And so um, before we close, uh, I wanted to know if there's something you want to share with us, what you were reading, what you found a particularly interesting or compelling. If you're reading Changed, um, what's on your bookshelf? Yeah, um, I, um, I think in terms of new books, I really, um, I really loved uh, Raven Leilani's Luster, um, uh, Jusuf Filial's collection, um, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Yeah. Um, I think that I was reading... I was reading and rereading because I taught a class. We have 
both traditional workshops and what we call readings courses, which are basically just literature courses taught by writers. And so I was teaching a course called Race, Passing and Performance. And so I was reading or rereading because I was interested in like the longevity of the passing narrative. And I was interested in why it kind of feels like it's coming back because <laughs> I think that you can sort of understand like the, the earlier form, forms of it make sense kind of chronologically. And I was like, what's going on in this historical moment that we've arrived back at the passing narrative. And so um, I don't know that I came up with an answer to that, but I, I did have fun thinking through the question. So I reread Plum Bon, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And I, um, and I read um, a lot of kind of other Harlem Renaissance residence novels, some kind of earlier, even early American lit that isn't quite passing it, passing adjacent like Ayo Leroy and, and yeah. things like that. And I, um, and then we got to the present. And so I, I'm not even the present, I guess I'm still talking about Caucasia like it's in the present, but I think I read Caucasia in college. So that was actually not the present, it turns out that was more than 15 years ago. Um, but, um, and then Rip Bennett's uh, the, the Vanishing Half and sort of thinking about um, passing as a long conversation. And there were so many books I didn't get a chance to even put on that syllabus because I think in a different version, we would have read like Black No More and Invisible Man and um, Maurice Ruffin's um, We Cast No Shadow. And that would have been another, and I went with just because we were also talking about gender a lot. We did um, we did The Bluest Eye and, um, and The Vanishing Half mm -hmm. and, um, and Plum Bon instead. But, um, but yeah, I can almost teach an entirely different version of that course where we read like half a different syllabus, so. Um, yeah, that's the fun thing. I mean, it's the creative and fun part of teaching. So I want to thank you so much for this wonderful evening with us, for reading and sharing. Um, and always know that you are welcome. You know, when you want to come back, you're always welcome. We always are waiting for what it is you're writing and cheering for you. Um, so thank you. I want to thank the audience. For, oh, it looks like there might be one question. I don't want to leave it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just a thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. And I want to uh, invite those of you who came this evening to two more events that we're going to be having this semester. Next Thursday uh, on March 24th at 6 p.m., we're having Making the Case for Reparations, a conversation with Erica Alexander and Whitney Dow, who are hosting a podcast on reparations. And then um, after that, in April, on April 14th, we have the second installment of our Black Arts Dialogues hosted by the novelist Ayanna Mathis, who is our curator for those dialogues. And she's going to be in conversation with the director, Dee Reese. So please join us for those. Be safe. And we look forward to seeing you again. Again, thank you, Danielle. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.